All right, hey, can I have you stand? We're gonna read the scripture this morning. Today, I'm gonna talk with you about how we can grieve with hope, how we can grieve with hope. And I wanna bring us to a passage of scripture that oftentimes is used to talk about the end times, and it does talk about the end times, but it also talks, more importantly, from a pastor's heart about the comfort and encouragement that we can have when we understand the hope and the good that's in store for us in the future. So, the Apostle Paul speaking from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Brothers and sisters, speaking to Christians, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Death. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Paul wants us to know there should be a difference in how Christians and unbelievers should grieve. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep, meaning died, in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are, who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not proceed those who have fallen asleep. He's addressing a local issue here with them. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and left will be, will, will, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Verse 18, here's why Paul says, this is why I gave it to you. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Words, word of the Lord. Father, we pray as we dive into your holy word, your holy scripture, you gave us this word for a reason. And so we pray, God, that this word would comfort and encourage us because all of us are gonna go through seasons of grieving. All of us are gonna go through times where we lose people that we love and we care about. And God, we know it's gonna be heavy, but give us hope and let us understand that even in those low moments, there is still good that we can look forward to. We pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus, the head of this church, amen and amen. You may take a seat. What happens after we die? This was the question that I asked a friend of mine, a new friend, he's not a believer, and I posed this question to him. I said, what happens after we die? As he started to think about it, he gave me an explanation. He said, well, I think, I think there's a heaven and I think there's a hell. I said, okay, all right. He knows I'm a pastor, by the way. So I was like, I'm not testing you. This is not like, you know, pencils down at the end of this. And, and, and then I said, well, what else? And he said, well, I think there's judgment. I, I think that, you know, you, you either go to heaven or hell and it's based on whether if you live, you know, your good outweighs your bad. If you do enough good, if it outweighs your bad, then that determines where you go. I said, okay, interesting. What else? I said, do we have bodies? Do we see people that we've loved after we die? Talk to me about that. And he sat there for a long pause, and he took a moment, and he said, to be honest with you, I don't really know. He said, I've never really thought about it. And I think, that that's the camp that a lot of us are in. We don't oftentimes think about what happens after we die. Like what happens after we die, our eyes closed, we get laid in a casket. What happens when our time here on earth is over? What happens when, you know, what happens after our eyes are closed? Do we open our eyes again? Do we live on again? Does it just go to blackness? And these things are important, incredibly important. Because what you believe about what happens next influences the way that you live here on earth, especially in those low moments. If when we go to a funeral and, and, and we're grieving the loss of somebody that we love, maybe somebody very close to us, if we don't know the good that we have in store that God has prepared for us in the future, that moment will be really, really dark and really, really devastating. And what God is saying, and what Paul is saying here, is that all of us will go through grieving, but some people will actually grieve without hope, and Christians 
should be able to grieve with hope. That it it should be different because of what we're informed about, to use the word of Paul, what we know about the future and what's coming our way should give us, should allow us to see good, right, even in those low moments and help us navigate and bring relief to the lowest, most challenging seasons of our life. Amen? So let me direct you and your attention to this passage that we just read, 1 Thessalonians, and really what I want to do here what I want to infuse and what I realize is that what we need most in a season of grief is a reason for relief. What you need when you're going through it, you just lost somebody, is you need somebody to come alongside of you and not just give you wishful thinking, but to say things to you that are concrete, that are going to reassure you and help you have relief as you're grieving in this low moment. I'll bring your attention to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. And I got four things this morning that will help us, if we can apply these, if we know these, we're informed about these, these will help us grieve with hope the way that God wants us to. Number one, we need to know that we will live again. Verse 13, Paul is speaking to believers in this passage that live in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians. He says, brothers and sisters, We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Let me pause there. Listen, there is no hope outside of Jesus. Jesus is everything to us. He is our hope. He is the foundation. Without Jesus, things start to unravel. So Paul just wants to be clear. If you're a Christian, if you have Jesus as your Lord, you have hope. And he talks about, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. The critical foundation, central to the faith that we have, most important thing that if we don't believe this, we we can't even claim to be Christians. It may be confusing to us, but if we don't believe it, we can't claim to stand uh, with Christians and on Christianity is the belief that Jesus died and rose again. That's the most important moment in history. It's the critical claim of Christianity. Paul says if there is no resurrection, then our faith is useless. It's meaningless. So if this is not true, if we don't know for sure that we can stand on it, then nothing else matters. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It proves that he is who he says he is. Jesus, if you know the story of the gospel, Jesus came down from heaven, born of a Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. She didn't sleep with Joseph before Jesus was, was, was in her womb. Jesus was born, lived a perfect life, and by the will of God, the Father went to the cross to die for our sins. He said, I came to seek and to save those who are lost. So Jesus was on a rescue mission. He knew that none of us could live a life that was good enough, where it was good enough, where God would say, hey, you haven't sinned, make it into my kingdom. All of us, say all to your neighbor, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God and sinned, everyone in this room. And it only takes one sin not to enter into the the, uh, abode, the kingdom, the city, the country of heaven. And so Jesus died on that cross, nailing our sins to that cross and the penalty with it so that me and you could have new life that's found in him. After three days, people thought the story was over. Even the disciples that were closest to Jesus thought the story was over. And two women showed up at the tomb to bring spices to the body, but the stone was rolled away. And an angel that was sent by God said, why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus is not in a tomb in Israel. There's no place in Israel where they have his bones in a box. He is risen on high. And hundreds of people saw him, including his disciples, who Thomas wanted to touch the places where Jesus had been pierced by the nails and the spear. This is the story of the gospel. Jesus came to die, and it's the critical claim, but he also came to resurrect. 
because death could not hold him in the grave. There could be no penalty for his, there could be no penalty of sin because he had no sin. And so this is the critical claim of Christianity, that we do not understand this, then nothing else matters. Paul, after stating that, says this is the foundation that then helps us understand what will happen with us. Because Jesus died and resurrected, we will die and resurrect. Now, you may say, well, we'll make that connection for you. I don't understand that. Well, if Jesus defeated death on the cross and paid for the penalty of our sins on the cross, then what the Bible says is the penalty, the penalty of sin is death. But if we don't have sin anymore, if sin is no longer, Jesus has washed, of our, washed us of our sins, then we cannot have the penalty of sin anymore, which is death, because Jesus has set us free. Am I, am I preaching too high this morning for some, for some of us? Because he died, you can live. Be, because his blood was shed, you're covered with his blood. Because he lived a perfect life, you stand before God with a theological term with his life imputed upon you so that when God Almighty looks at your life, he looks at the perfect life that Jesus lived because he lived a perfect life and died as the perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God that was slain for the sins of the world. And because of what's been done, what Jesus has done, it's set a domino effect for what's gonna happen in our life. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, chapter, chapter 15, verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits, the first domino of those who have fallen asleep. Anytime you see asleep here, it's gonna be speaking to the equivalent of death. The reason that the Christians use the word asleep is, is because they realize, hey, Death is not final for us. So let's use a different word. They, they had to find new language because they're like, hey, things have changed for us. So hey, we, we, we close our eyes and then we wake up and like, hey, Jesus, what's up, man? We're with you. We're in heaven. So they moved away from the language of death because it sounded too final for them. So they started to use and incorporate the language of sleep to, to communicate with the early Christians. Listen to Romans chapter six, verse five. For if we have been united with him like this in his death, we die to ourself. That's what baptism symbolizes. Dead to the old self, alive in Jesus Christ, we certainly will also be united with him in his resurrection. This is the doctrine of the unity that we have with Jesus Christ himself. Let me give you a picture throughout the Bible. When Paul is walking... Uh, on the road, uh, the Damascus road, Paul is walking on the Damascus road and there's a light that hits him and Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And Paul's like, what? What do you mean I'm persecuting you? Jesus is associating himself with the church that's being persecuted. The fact that Paul is persecuting and killing the church is direct equivalence to what he's doing to Jesus. When Ananias and Sapphira and Acts lie to the apostle Peter, that he says, how could you lie to the Holy Spirit? What's happening there? Well, there's such a close intertwining of the relationship now that a believer has with God that it's like we're walking in step. We hide behind the covering of God, but we are united with Christ in this new life that we live. So when he dies, we die. If he resurrects, we resurrect as well. And this is critical to the faith that we believe. Paul goes as far as saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if we do not believe that we will rise again, then we do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's so intertwined for him. He's like, you cannot have one without the other. If you do not believe we resurrect, you do not believe Jesus resurrected. But if you do believe that, then you have to believe that we will rise again. And I wanna shake that claim for you a little bit this morning because not everyone believes there's life after we close our eyes. There's a lot of research and data out there and you have a lot of conversations with people about this. But I have, you know, one of the uh, uh, popular opinions of what happens after you die is that your uh, consciousness just starts to float out in the universe and you become one with the universe. That's a sad existence. But there's like 30 or 40% of people that believe that. 
Some people believe that when you die, you just, it just goes black. And you know, you're just, that's just, that's life. You know, there's nothing after you live here on earth. It goes black, you close your eyes, you become like the dirt and life moves on without you. It was so much believed like that in Paul's day that they basically, there was this famous quote that would go around that was basically like, hey, I don't care what happens to me. They put on their grave because my life is over. So not everybody, a lot of the ideas that we believe today, like my friend who I was talking to, come from Christian theology that's embedded within the culture, and people like to step into the claims of Christianity without following Jesus. Uh Uh-oh. And so that's okay that people want to adopt this, but there's a trust and a faith that only comes from when you know that you're in him. That's the language that Paul's using here. Paul is saying, you have life after death, If you are in him, if you have a relationship with him, you've been washed by his blood, you put your faith in what he's done on you saying, I couldn't earn my salvation, but I trust in what Jesus has done on the cross for me. It's not about me standing before God and telling my list of good deeds or weighing the good and the bad. No, I could never do enough good to outweigh my bad. I trust in what Jesus has done on the cross for me. And when I put my faith and trust in what he's done, he washes me, he cleanses me, and he says, you know what, Josiah, you're not just a friend of mine, but you're family. I'm going to call you a son. I've adopted you into my family, and you now have a new life that you didn't have before. <laughs> Let me bring this to, to your home a little bit. One, I talk with people that are afraid of death a lot of times, and they'll say, Pastor, can you pray with me? I'll say, sure, what do you want me to pray with you about? And they'll say, I'm, I'm really afraid of dying, especially after COVID. A lot of people will come up to me, I'm really afraid of dying. Can I tell you, if you're really, really afraid of dying, it's because you're really, really not informed about what the Bible says. You can be afraid of having pain, but don't be afraid of death, because death has lost its sting, the Bible says. When, when, when we die, we go to be with Jesus. When we die, we go to be in, in, the, in, in heaven on streets of gold. When we die, we go to be in a place where there's no suffering, there's no pain, there's no more death, there's, none, there's no corruption, there's no sin. When we die, everything that, was, that, we, that we were in this broken world here becomes a shadow that's behind us, and we get put into the presence of God immediately in paradise. Some people think that when you die, you just go into the ground. That's not a biblical thought. Soul sleep is not a biblical idea. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And I know I'm giving you a lot. I'm packing a lot in here. Are you okay? 10 of you. Are you, I'm, I'm like. 2 Corinthians 5, 8, Paul says, I prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So Paul is saying, if I die, I'm with God. He's not saying my body sits in the ground for a long time and I wait for the resurrection to come, Jesus to come back. That's not what he's saying. Saying if I'm dead, I'm with him. Philippians chapter one, verse 23, Paul says, I'm torn between being here and being there. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Paul's like, if I'm gonna live here, I'm gonna live on mission, but I'm ready to be with Jesus. Jesus himself, when he's on the cross, and he's talking with the thief on the cross, doesn't say, hey, truly I tell you, after you're in the ground for a really long time, then you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. There was an immediate connection. And what I'm trying to do today is inform you so that when you, as a Christian, you don't have to be afraid of death because it just ushers you into the presence of the one that you love. It just ushers you into the place that you want to be. So we don't have that fear. But also, when you have friends and family, coworkers, neighbors, people that you love, that have a relationship with Jesus, they've been washed by the blood, they're a son or daughter of the Most High, they've been saved. Can I tell you? What the Bible's saying here is that those people that we love are immediately alive with Jesus in his presence. Think about that. Hold on, hold on. Don't don't clap yet. Think about that for a moment. Some of you have had people in your life that you love so much that have been suffering on their bed with cancer. It's eating away at their body. They're constantly in pain. They put their faith and trust in Jesus, and then they die. Can I tell you, what a celebration. 
It's sad that we lose them. It breaks our heart. I've cried and been at so many funerals and wakes with people that have been devastated. It is, uh, grief is always devastating, but it doesn't have to be without hope because we realize, you know what? That person that was suffering is not suffering anymore. And that person is with Jesus. And that person is in paradise. And so we know we can trust in what God says that immediately they are put in, not because of what we've done, but because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's number two. The second reason we can grieve with hope is this. Number two, we know that we can have complete confidence. Listen to verse 15. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. You know, I talk with people sometimes about death, and they'll say, I wish I could believe like you. Almost like what I believe is a crutch for me because I can't handle the hardness of life. And, 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 and like, yeah, I, I'd love to believe that, but it's, it's wishful thinking. I had someone who recently tell me, well, no one can really know. No one can really know. If you don't know Jesus and you don't read his word, no one can know. But if you know Jesus and you read his word, you can know. He makes it clear here. And what the apostle Paul is trying to communicate to us, because we don't have this, all scripture is inspired, all scripture is God breathed, but he makes a specific reference here according to the Lord's word. Now what he's saying there is there was a prophetic word that it was either given to one of the early church prophets or was given to Paul himself. So God Almighty said, hey, I wanna give you a special word that you'll preserve in the scripture for the church that's in Thessalonica so that they can be comforted in what they're going through. I want the church to know this so that they can be comforted when they're grieving. This is special from God. This is a word, a prophetic word that was given to the apostle Paul and he's letting them know, specifically in this language, that you can trust it because it comes from Jesus. You know, growing up, when you're trying to really know if you can trust somebody or trust something, when I was, you know, in school or on the playground, I'd be like, all right, dog, like, I, I want you, pinky swear with me. Pinky swear. Remember this? would be like, double dog there. Double dog there. Oh, you're not, and then you'd spit out like, triple dog there, triple dog, triple dog, triple dog. It's triple dog, you better be serious. You better be serious, triple dog. And you make these like, but, but what you're saying is, you know, hey, I, I, I want you to really, really, you know, be sure that you're gonna do this thing with me. And we try to get my dad to do that with us too. We're like, all right, dad, if you're gonna do it, pinky swear it though, dad. Double dog, triple dog, dad. And he'd always say, I'm not gonna do that. And we're like, well, we wanna know. And he said, no. I wanna teach you an important lesson. The Bible says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. So I don't have to promise pinky or double dog or triple dog or spit on your hand because my word is my bond. I, when I say yes, I mean I'm gonna be there. When I say no, I, you know, I'm not gonna be there. And so you can trust my word. What he was teaching us is the weight of his words came from the weight of his character and his trustworthiness. If he's not trustworthy, then his words don't have much weight. But if I know that the person is trustworthy and true, some of you are sleeping. If I know that the person is trustworthy and true, and I look over here and I realize that their words also have that same weight, it carries on and it helps me live the way they've called me to. Paul is saying, these are not light words. These are from the one who is trustworthy and true, who has always existed and will always exist. This is from your Lord and your Savior, the one who came and died and was resurrected again. This is from Jesus Christ himself, so these words carry weight. So this is not wishful thinking, because what Jesus says always will be. This is certain. You can have confidence. Now, as a pastor, I will tell you what's wishful thinking. And there's a bitter sweetness uh, as I communicate this message because if you fully grasp what I'm saying uh, today about the reality of people being in Christ and out of Christ and hope being in Christ or not having hope outside of Christ, there's a beautiful essence to saying, amazing God, I can't believe. And there's a devastating essence to say, those who are not in Christ are eternally separated from God Almighty himself. 
You cannot enter into the kingdom of God if you are not in him. We will all stand judgment before we're the king. And what Paul is trying to clearly communicate here is that this is not wishful thinking. Sometimes I go to funerals and, you know, I know why people say it and I understand it, it's okay. But at every funeral I've ever been at, people will always say to the person that's grieving, well, I'm just happy they're in a better place now. I know why they say it. You say it as a token of saying, I, I, you know, I want you to feel some type of relief with the pain that you're going through. If they were suffering or they're in a better place. But can I tell you, there is nothing that is more wishful thinking than they are in a better place. They're in a better place. Yeah, it may make them feel good, but that is the essence of wishful thinking. I've been to some funerals where people live totally uh, immoral, broken, distant lives from God. Even the way that they died showed the corruption of their sin and the way they live. And only God knows if they made a decision in the last moment or their last seconds of their life. But let me tell you this. It is wishful thinking to say that everybody that's lived on the face of the earth is just in a better place. And I want you as a Christian not to stop saying that, but what I want you as a Christian to come back and say, this is not wishful thinking that we have been given confidence from Jesus Christ himself that when we die, we go to be with him. When we die, we have confidence that when we open our eyes, we will be in paradise. And for those that we love so much that we're in him, we can have confidence that they're in paradise with God. We saw the fruit of their life. They walked with Jesus. They knew Jesus. We can have confidence. I hope they're there. No, 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 no. There's some people that I saw the essence of their life, their walk, the consistency, and I'm like, I can't wait to see that person in heaven again because they showed the walk of Jesus in every area of their life. They were a firm believer in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus wants us to have confidence in this essence that he said it, and we can trust that what he says is the reality. We can rest assured that our loved ones, that are believers, are in a good place. Number three, we can grieve with hope because we know that we will be, some of you in this room, this is, you're in this season right now. I know because I'm pastoring, you're in this season right now. Let me just remind you that we will know that we will be with loved ones again. It breaks my heart. You know, I, I, we, we pray afterwards today. We do our healing prayer after service with everybody. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm there to pray with people that are, uh, you know, going through grieving. And it just shatters my heart sometimes. I'm on the phone with people or talking with people and, and they're devastated. Oftentimes I'm in there with just the immediate family. I'm led into the inner circle of their suffering and their pain that they're feeling. And it's, it's, you know, there's, it's, not, it's not unusual for me to be crying with them because there's so much heaviness there when you grieve somebody that you love. And there's not a lot of things that can pull somebody, give them even a little bit relief in those times. But this is one of those things. That if they had their faith and trust in Jesus, that there is confidence that we will see them again. Listen to verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together. That's where the word rapture comes from the Greek and then the Latin. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You know what? Jesus is coming again. He is coming again. But he's not coming as a lamb to be slain. The next time that he'll come will be in the twinkling of an eye, Corinthians says. He will come in but a flash, and he will come back for his bride, the church. He will come back for the people that have made decisions, that are followers of him, committed, washed by the blood, part of his family. And so Paul here is going to give us a uh, understanding of how this rapture will unfold and kind of the events that will happen. He says, the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Jesus will be in the clouds. There will be a loud command. There will be the voice of an archangel. There will be the trumpet call of God. And then he gives us the order of who will be taken up with him first. So let me be clear. What happens when you die? Well, if you're a Christian, when you die, your spirit goes to be with God in heaven immediately, like Paul said, and Jesus. But your body goes to be in the ground. So they put you in a casket or they put you in a vase and they sprinkle your, you know, body all over the, you know, the, you know, my dad wants me to like put him 
he wants, he wants us to, you know, cremate them and then take them, like, six different places. Like, go, you know, take me to the river and then, like, take me to... I'm, I'm like, Dad, like, you're dead, man. I mean, you're like... <laughs> what am I going on a six-journey step? Like, put your body over here and put your little thing over here. And I'm just... Now, now Jesus has got to scatter you all over from all over the place. And what he's talking about here, though, is that... So that's the reality. Our bodies will be in the ground. Our spirits will be in heaven. And when Jesus comes back for the rapture... He's going to bring the spirits of the, the uh, Christians that are living in heaven in spirit form. He's going to bring them with him in the air as he comes back. And as the trumpet blasts, the trumpet blasts, those of us that are in the faith, in him, in Jesus, will be taken up. That's the language. Caught up, seized up with him. I don't know if it's a Superman thing or what's going on, but we're all taken up immediately. My imagination gets pretty excited when I start to think about these things. I'm like, maybe I could go like this, you know? And he'll take us up with him, and we, and he, but he says who hap, what happens first, that the dead in Christ will rise first. This is important. This is where we get our imperishable, eternal, glorified bodies. In the air, in the twinkling of an eye, those saints that first were dead, that come from heaven, get their new bodies for all of eternity. They won't wear, they won't break down, they'll be eternal, and they'll be imperishable. And then after them, we join them and we get our new bodies as well. So those saints in the room, you know, those aches you got in your knees right now. And those like, you know, you're like, ah, that foot problem, gone. All of it, gone, gone, gone. <laughs> and then we'll go into heaven as, a, as, as his church, we'll go into heaven with him. I'm giving you the order. This is very theological, but I'm giving it to you so you know when you have clarity because we are informed. Jesus has made it clear. Now, when we're in heaven, I imagine that a little bit, as we come into heaven, we're now seeing believers, we're all there, we're seeing believers that have put their faith in Jesus, they're in their new bodies. I mean, imagine it. Seeing your brother, your cousin, you're like, oh man, I missed you, I can't wait. You're also gonna see some people like, uncle? How'd you make it? You didn't have any faith your entire life. Like, how are you here? And he'll tell you, like, man, the nurse came in one minute before I died, and she shared the gospel, and two seconds left, I received Jesus was my Lord and my Savior. That's the shortest working out of faith ever. Shortest sanctification. Two seconds, God, you know, worked me up in two seconds, and he's like, you're here, kid. Like, welcome home. So I believe that there will be some people that make uh, decisions there that will be like shocked that they're there, but I also think we'll be shocked by who's not there. I think we're gonna be like, well, where's, where's this person? They, they, were, they went to church every week, where are they? Oh, they, they never truly had faith. They were doing religious stuff, but they didn't know Jesus. But where, where's that? They gave a lot of money. Where, where did that person go? Oh, yeah, they were doing that for other people and Jesus exposed it at the end and burned it all away and that was all about themselves and yeah, they didn't make it. They didn't make it, and that's really sad. That's really sad that, it, that they didn't make it. I think there's gonna be some of that. Shocked by some people that just made it by the, you know, by the, I mean, all, all by the grace of God, but right there at the end, and other people that didn't make it in that you just thought they were the most, and God goes, they never knew me. They, they never knew me. And so we will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet, and here's, here's, the, here's the final thing. So, well, actually, if you're here, and you're a follower of Jesus, would you be so encouraged by the hope that we have of seeing people that we love in the faith again? There's some of you in here that you, you've lost somebody a few years ago, a little recently, and you loved them so much, and you knew they had faith. Can I tell you, you're gonna see them again. You're gonna see them again with Jesus. They had faith in him. They walked with him. They had fruit. You're gonna see grandmothers and cousins. You're gonna see some of you parents that have lost children, man, I've walked alongside of you, man, you're gonna see some of your kids again. You're gonna be there with them, man. You're gonna embrace them. Probably look different than when you saw them last. You're gonna say, wow, it's been 20 years, 50 years, lost you this, lost you that. And you're gonna be able to embrace them. It will be an unbelievably glorious time. <laughs> unbelievably, unbelievably glorious time. 
It's in those moments when we're grieving and we're going through. Grief is only on this side of, you know, death is only on this side of eternity. So we're going to navigate it. But I want you to remember in those low moments, I want you to remember you will see them again if they had their faith in Jesus. Don't you forget that. It's a promise. It's to Christianity too. If you're a Christian, if you don't, not a Christian, I can't promise you're going to see anything. There's no promises with that. I, I don't have any word. of This is what Jesus says for the Christians, and he speaks to unbelievers as well, but this is not something we're making up or that makes us feel good. We're trusting the words of Jesus who holds life and death, who's the uh, Lord of the living and the dead, that this is the reality that he has built for everybody to, to experience. And last but not least, the final reality that we need to remember to grieve with hope is that we will know that we will be with Jesus forever. When we're in the air connecting with the other believers from old and new, it says we will meet the Lord in the air and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Oh man, we're gonna be there. Think about it. We've just been raptured up together. We're all in the clouds, immediately twinkling eye. We're all in heaven with Jesus. We're like, dude, look at the new body. This is amazing. You know, we're checking it out. And I always talk with people and when I talk with people, they're like, they're reading their Bible, I'm like, man, I just can't read, wait to meet David, pastor. Like, man, like, David, how'd you do it? You know, how'd you take Goliath down, you know? Or they'll say, oh, I was reading Exodus, and I just can't wait to meet Moses. Like, Moses, what was the bush like? Like, oh, it was a big bush, it was a small bush, and Noah, I Noah, man, like, like the boat, I mean, 40 days on a boat, the wood, like what, you know, the draft, how did you get the drafts on the boat? Like, how did you... And people have all of these questions. And there's gonna be some saints there, Moses, David, Elijah, some amazing saints, but we're also gonna be run to our family. We're gonna see our cousins and our aunts and uh, great-grandparents, great-great-great-great-grandparents and people in the faith that we miss and haven't seen and we love and we care for, ready to experience all eternity. Imagine you get there and your grandpa's there, your cousin's there, your aunts are like, oh, you guys are here. I, I can't wait to, let's talk, let's catch up. I'm, I mean, I... And you know what they're going to say to you? Oh, man, we can't wait to catch up with you. It's great to see you. Man, I, I can't wait to spend all eternity. We made it. This is amazing. I, especially those that have died, like, I can't wait to show you around heaven. I can't wait to show you around heaven. Let me show you some of my favorite spots. But before all of that, more important than the streets of gold and the saints that are great that have died, like Esther and Moses and and more important than our family members that we care about, you know who they're going to tell you? But before, before I show you the best places in heaven, have you met him yet? H have you seen? Have you seen him? Have, have I seen who? Have you seen him? Have you seen him? Oh, he's so much better than you, than you, you could have ever possibly imagined. I know you walked with him on earth, but he, he is the essence of love. He is the epitome of love. He is trustworthy and true. He is gracious and faithful. He is amazing. And what makes this place so special is not the streets of gold or all our friends and the great saints that have died, but it's one person individually. It is Jesus. It's the fact that God is here. And what was broken in the garden what was taken from us in the garden that we could not walk with Jesus anymore because of the sin of Adam and Eve and an angel barred us from a place of eternity with being able to live with Adam and Eve. What barred us from the paradise that we walk with Jesus is restored on the other side of heaven. The imperishable bodies that we had to, uh, the bodies that we had that we had to keep up by eating the fruit to, to keep us uh, from dying, now we have imperishable bodies. Why do we have our bodies and God not just let us be our spirit? Because we had our bodies before the fall. It was always part of creation. And so what was broken in the garden is now restored in paradise within, within heaven. And this was always God's plan. As he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, he will walk with us in heaven. But as the word says, now you see him like a, like a, like a, like a mirror, and their mirrors were, were made out of metal. It's, it's, it's foggy. You can't fool. We have a relationship, but, but then we will see him face to face. Can you imagine seeing Jesus? 
face to face, the one you love and you care for, the one who's always been there, supported you, carried you, died for you, loves you more than anyone who has ever walked the face of the earth loves you. He will meet you face to face, eye to eye, look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant with his arms open to embrace you. And you will spend forever, forever, and you will never get tired of it. You will never say it was better on earth because earth will be just a shadow of what we experience in heaven. Revelations capture, Revelation 21 captures it and finishes by saying this, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God, just like in the garden. He will wipe away, listen to the personal language of our God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. 